Hello, thank you so much for tuning in to today's discussion panel. Uh, my name is Yasmina Tawil and I am the Director of Film Programming at the Arab Film and Media Institute. AFMI is the first organization of its kind outside of the Arab world. It is a unique ecosystem to find, nurture, and develop Arab film and media pro projects. It was rebranded from the Arab Film Festival in 2017 to fulfill a broader mandate to empower local Arab talent to tell their community stories and their own voices through education, mentorship, and new media. Our mission is to enhance public understanding of Arab culture and provide insight into the beauty, complexity, and diversity intrinsic to, intrinsic to the Arab world. Um, and while we rebranded from the Arab Film Festival, we still host an annual Arab Film Festival every year. This year is our 26th year, um, and this panel is part of that festival. If you're tuning in and you'd like to learn more about AFMI, you can go to arabfilminstitute.org, or if you'd like to learn more about the festival, maybe buy a ticket, watch a movie, you can go to arabfilmfestival.org, and there will be more information there. Today we have a panel featuring four of the filmmakers in our Queer Lens short program in discussion about queerness in the Arab world, moderated by Rafi Raid Rafai. And with that, I will hand it over to Raid, and uh, I hope everyone enjoys the conversation. Thank you so much, Yasmina. I, I really specifically want to thank you for curating those films together. I mean, it's, it's such a these films like really are in conversation with each other and I am very excited to be with you all. I would like to thank Serge also for having an amazing vision for the festival year after year and everybody behind the scene. So with us, uh, Sara, who is the director of Sara Asas, the, di or Kaskas, the director of The Window, uh, Karina Dandashi, the director of Dress Up, uh, Nauris uh, Sagar, uh, the director of Habib and the Thief, and um, Daniel Abdir, the director of Warsha, uh, Aziz Zuramba, the director of Faraway, uh, uh, Faraway could not be with us, unfortunately. So welcome all. Uh, the title that I gave provisionally for, for this panel is Arab plus Queer plus Film between here and there to really think about the combination of those concepts and terms. And, um, and the panel will try to highlight the richness and diversity of queer film production in the Arab region and its diasporas. We will discuss the queer films we have seen uh, in this Queer Lens program as spaces of reflection and contestation and as frameworks for alternative world making. Um, we will be thinking about queerness as a lens to engage with everyday precarity in the Middle East, but also queerness um, as a way to make sense of the alienating experience of displacement, whether it's in the West or, or, or even uh, for uh, Indania's film uh, for Syrian and Lebanon. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm very excited, uh, and I would like to start by you know saying that uh, as the famous uh, feminist adage professors, the personal is political. I feel your films are, are very personal and political in a certain way. So I'd like you each to just start by introducing yourselves uh, briefly and maybe talking also briefly about uh, some of the main inspirations behind your work. I don't know who would like to start. I can start. Um, uh... Hello, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Sara Kaskas. Uh, I'm a Lebanese director. Uh, I'm also the writer director of The Window. Uh, the Window talks about uh, two women who reunite one year after the Beirut port explosion. They reunite in their old bedroom and they kind of go through a very quick discussion uh, about what happened over this year. Um, for me, the, the whole thing started uh, Basically, I'm a survivor of the explosion, and I needed to find a way to, uh, I don't know if the right word is process, but kind of uh, find a way to discuss between myself, really, uh, what happened uh, and the reactions, the extreme reactions that happened personally uh, inside of me and also what I was seeing uh, within my community. 
this whole uh, this whole thing that we're all going through right now in Lebanon, which is should I stay or should I go? Uh, so it was really this kind of pull in opposite directions that really made me kind of sit down and and start writing this film. Um, yeah, and that became my my main inspiration how it all started. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. Um, and this uh, certainly, uh, I mean, we can feel that. Uh, those emotions and tensions in the film. Someone else would like to, uh, on, on my screen, maybe Karina is next, is that? Sorry to put you no, on the no, spot. you're good. Um, yeah, so my name is Karina. Uh, I'm the director of Dress Up. Um, Dress Up's about a young woman who on the eve of her sister's wedding, um, her queer anxieties begin to unravel. Um, it's a very personal film. It's mostly inspired by my experience, my life, as I started to explore my sexuality, my bisexuality, um, and sort of looking also at fam family dynamics, like my sister and how her relationship was open and treated, you know, more differently. And like how I was sort of envious of, you know, her, her relationship and the way that she could express it and I couldn't um, to our parents. Um, so that's sort of where the inspiration started. Um, and as I said, it is a very personal film. I star in the film, my sister stars in the film. Um, and we also like, I also interweave like home videos uh, for my own family. So um, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's very intimate in that way. Um, yeah, I think I just wanted to share a window into my own experience um, with my queerness, so yeah. Great, and we will unpack a lot of this. I mean, the intimacy in the film is just uh, something that I felt very strongly. I don't know, going, is that clockwise, <laughs> Daniel? Um, so, hi, so my name is Dania Abder. I am uh, Lebanese, originally Syrian. Both my parents are Syrian, but I grew up in Beirut. And uh, my film is Warsha. Uh, Warsha was inspired from a day I was sitting in Lebanon and I looked up and at the time Beirut was full of cranes and I saw a man standing on top of a crane. And when I thought he was going to jump, I kept watching him and then as he kneeled down, I realized he was praying and that image really stuck in my head and I realized that these crane operators, they um, have their own world where they can see everything, nobody can see them and it's like such a little bubble of privacy. And around the time I was like exploring this idea of this film about a crane operator, the Hansla is an incredible multi-talented singer, dancer, aerialist, all around performer. He dropped his first single in his music video and he transcends gender in ways that like you can't express really. Watching him live took my breath away. And when he and I started talking and we talked about this film, we started discussing what if what he wants to express out there, the, the, the crane operator up there is a kind of a, a secret desire or a passion that he can't really express in his daily life. And so the film is really born from that conversation and from our collaboration together. Yes, thank you. I mean, it's. Um, I, I also want to unpack a lot of what you said. But we, those visions like come across very powerfully. Last but not least, uh, Nouris. Marhaba, everyone. Uh, I'm Nouris Sagar. I am Iraqi, uh, born in Bulgaria, but my family moved to Sweden when I was three years old. So I grew up here in Sweden, where I live, and. Uh, run my own production company with my boyfriend. And uh, the last short film we did was Habib and the Thief, um, which is meant to capture a time of my life when I partied quite a lot. And, uh, you know, we would go to all these parties and from one second to another, it could go from fun and games to just a terrible nightmare because you never know when you know, the clash and the shift is going to happen uh, in meeting someone who might be homophobic. Uh, so it's very taken from my own personal experiences. Um, uh, some of the dialogue in the car, uh, in the taxi car in the movie is taken from my own life. And uh, so, yeah, it's captured both the fun and the party and also the... Uh, yeah, the downside. Wonderful, and I, I really felt those, uh, you know, those extremes and those tensions. 
forgot to uh, also introduce myself. Uh, I'm a Lebanese filmmaker and researcher. I'm currently based in San Francisco, where I'm finishing uh, a PhD in film salmon's uh, queer film from Lebanon and its diasporas. Um, so now I, I'd like to uh, ask a specific question of each one of you. And um, I'll start with uh, Nauda since, uh, you know, we're, we're still thinking about your film. I was actually really struck by this uh, idea of queer joy in your film. I, I found this really ref refreshing. Um, I mean, some people might think of, uh, you know, the world you create in your film as self-orientalizing, but I really felt that um, that it, it was a, a bold affirmation uh, of Arab queer culture um, and, and really a wonderful reflection of queer joy. So can you talk uh, a little bit more about that? Uh, I heard everything except the last sentence. What was that? Uh, the last sentence was, it, it, it's also a wonderful reflection of Arab queer joy and Arab queer camp. Uh, there is a background noise somewhere. I don't know where it's coming from. Oh, oh okay. Construction. Lebanon. Okay. Not, I, I wish it's Barcelona. I wish. <laughs> uh, no worries. Okay, so, um, yes, thank you so much. Uh, basically, I uh, do have a lot of uh, Middle Eastern friends here in Sweden, and uh, we do have a community here, and we, uh, I mean, there are also some parties now recently that has started with uh, uh, Middle Eastern theme and uh, DJs who are playing Middle Eastern modern techno party music and stuff like that. Uh, so it's, uh, but by making these movies, it's also um, a way for me to like encourage that and uh, show people what is possible and just bring out the joy in being Arab and queer and have, uh, have that in a movie that way. It's, it, it's something that I, myself would love to see and uh you know just be spread more basically thank you notice uh i mean i, I also related a lot to those uh to those uh, queer air parties because we have some in san francisco um i, I would like to move now to sarah uh, very different uh, atmosphere but there is also a party happening outside outside the room uh your film really hit very close to home as i uh i was telling you before the panel started i'm lebanese and i i, I live uh in san francisco i'm a recent immigrant uh here um so it was very emotional uh, watching uh watching it um and can you talk a, a little bit about the charged political um, and social context uh, of your story of uh, Lebanon and how it also impacts uh, queer people in Lebanon in, in, in specific ways. Yeah, um, so basically I feel like I need to talk a lot about the process of how I wrote the film because it, it really just kind of brought out uh, a lot and um, the biggest challenge I had like it was to cover a lot of really important points to to how they reach there uh, without spoon feeding um, and I, I really felt that it, it just came very naturally like if you are very close to someone uh, there's just like a look or or like when they remember a song and they start dancing you don't have to say oh, do you remember we were there and we did this and that, like you just understand that this was part of something that they experienced together. Um, and the way I wrote it and how to bring out all those things uh, was that actually, because I talked about this whole, uh, you know, opposing conflicts that we're going through now, should I stay, should I go? Uh, so basically I recorded uh, myself arguing with myself um, about this, this part of me that wants to leave right now and the part that wants to stay. 
uh, and it was just kind of like this argument every time I came up with something like an like a argument for staying the other side of me would would you know, counter argue and stuff like that so uh, it's a very funny recording in a way uh, it's about an hour long and and throughout all this discussion I started talking about things uh, about the community about you know the political climate the economy uh what it feels like to be trapped in hell on earth literally um and and the beauty that comes out of it through solidarity of the community as well so all these things started coming up and they were they were never um really kind of uh, literal they, they just felt very organic in a conversation uh, even if, if it was a conversation with myself but still um, and that's how I started writing the script. I just kind of listened back to it and wrote down notes that I felt could really fit in 15 minutes uh, and then created the characters from there. Um, I think it was really important to me to really go through really, like really key points, which is, you know, the even through sound, like I used a lot of the aesthetic tools to kind of translate some things without needing them to say it. Uh, you know, the noise outside, the party outside, you know, even though there's a explanation to the gathering outside, uh, to me, it was also this, you know, there's there's this constant, um, you know, detachment from from what we're going through. And we need to kind of numb ourselves and, and stay kind of always feel alive through this partying and gatherings and everything. So that's like a constant thing in the background. Uh, and that was there also to, to add this, uh, the fact that what, what we're going through right now. Uh, the noise outside, obviously the the you know the overpowering image of the of the remains of the silos, um, all of what's happening outside versus of what's happening inside. Uh, I felt I needed to also talk about what's going through the community because, you know, we we were really building uh, our voices and we were really out there, especially uh, in the revolution um, on October seventeenth in two thousand nineteen. We were really kind of banding together and, and just out on the streets. And then, you know, the economy started crashing and, you know, this thing started snowballing out of control and, and then the explosion. And it just became exhausting to, and, and especially that we lost a lot of our safe spaces. So I feel like also this was a point I needed to say, we're still there obviously. And we're still, you know, there in solidarity together, but it's also really, it's becoming a lot more difficult to kind of get out there and, you know, band together and, you know, uh, just be as loud as we were. Uh, so this was also something I wanted to, to mention. Um, and of course, the, you know, what's happening uh, economically and socially with the, you know, the dimension of, you know, leaving and uh, being able to, you know, fill the fill the cars with gas and you know stuff like that and and the medications and stuff. So I, I had to I felt like I had to touch on a lot of these points and of course also the trauma of uh, of the explosion. You know how they how they deal with it, the things that they say about it. Uh, you know, the still jumping. I mean, I we were all there, so I feel like this was all stuff I needed to to discuss, and I think putting them in this context of a tiny room where they can't get out of, even though they can, they, they choose to stay in there. Every time they reach for the door to leave, they either keep each other inside or choose to stay to say one more thing. So I feel like trapping them in this tiny, tiny room with such an overwhelming image from the outside with the silos uh, kind of forced all of these things out pretty organically. Um, and yeah, I. Thank you, Sarah. I mean, this is uh, what you were saying. Thank you for sharing from the heart. Uh, I mean, all those layers of trauma. And I want to talk more about this tension between uh, the private and the public and how in your film, I mean, as you said, uh, they're trapped, but then the outside keeps on seeping in. Uh, I'll talk more about that. Uh, but uh, staying in Lebanon, I I'd like to ask Danya, um, I think also your film draws on, on a complex socio-political situation in Lebanon, that of the Syrian migrant workers um, uh, who are fleeing the war in the country and, and also facing a lot of uh, racism in Lebanon. And, and you highlight in the film, uh, for me, such a new, fresh look 
into um, this community of workers through a queer homoerotic lens. I, I don't think I've, I've seen other films do that. I, I thought that was really powerful to think about this intersection between queerness and class. And, um, and you are thinking about queerness um, uh, you know, in unusual ways. And um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about, uh, I mean, you mentioned also your uh, working with Hansa, who, as you said, is an amazing uh, queer performer and artist. Um, so how, how, how was it for you to really bring those two worlds together, the world, uh, you know, the world of performance, the world of Hansa, and the world of uh, the Syrian migrant workers? Um, actually, it was, it was much more organic than you would think. Um, it's even though they feel like such faraway worlds, they're not that far away because on one hand when i first started thinking about a film about a crane operator i started researching by going and visiting a lot of construction sites and every time i would go to a construction site i would be hit with three very palpable um uh, kind of feelings and elements that were always there one it's a very masculine space i was always the only woman there it was very noticeable everyone looked at me and it's it kind of i stood out Two, it's an extremely loud space, like it's really rhythmically intensely a cacophony of sounds. You can hardly hear yourself think, let alone dream or, you know, uh, be distracted. And three, it's um, because the workers in Lebanon are historically Syrian, like even before the war, uh, construction workers have always been Syrian. You can really feel a very distinct uh, difference in segregation between the workers or the engineers. And there was a feeling of because a lot of them tended to be undocumented, underpaid. There was a feeling of like kind of a replaceable element for each of them. And they tended to operate together and move together as a group. They arrived together in the morning, they came in the vans, they stayed together in the same house, and they would kind of try to call the least attention to themselves as possible. So um, this idea of this character wanting to having the opportunity to get on a crane and climb up above and leave all of that behind, leave the masculine world, leave the sounds and the noises to be able to hear himself and then leave away the like uh, socio-political uh, uh, differences to really be with himself, especially someone who doesn't really have the luxury of privacy. That was the, the beautiful thing to explore. And then the idea of, you know, loving music, or song or dance or performance or being seen and being celebrated, that kind of queerness felt like, why the fuck not? Of course, why the fuck not? What do we know about these, anyone who works in any job that you haven't necessarily lived yourself and or whatever image you have of a construction worker or of a Syrian refugee or something that you would think you know everything about the person, but those are all kind of, um, uh, you know, you're just, happen to be born on that side of the border, you happen to be born in that side of the, uh, with that passport, with that ethnicity, with that whatever. But what really makes each person um, unique and special is what, what are your dreams? What do you think about when you put your head on the pillow between you and yourself? And what would you want to let out? And so for him, we, we imagine this person who grew up watching uh, Fawazir Ramadan and watching Sharihan and loving with, with his mom, with his family, loving these opening sequences that were larger than life where she would change into 25 different characters and 25 different outfits and, and having that like really warm memory inside and, and never being able to just like live it out and express it out except in this, in this cabin and in that moment. And it was a very kind of purposeful decision to not get into sexuality. And I do that with wanting it to kind of share that film all around the Middle East and whenever some people have seen it from the Arab world and they ask but how is he, he's praying and he's Muslim but then he's gay and, and we was always stopping and ask first of all who said anything about him being gay this is a person who is singing who is dancing, who has makeup on like men have had in the Arab world through history like with kuhul and with, with the dresses and with twirling dervishes and all of these things are part of our history so why gender norms is really the main thing to to question here who said you can't and why can't he um kind of let that out and express and and finally have the chance to be seen and celebrated um in this country that doesn't 
usually really accept uh, his presence there and 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 uh, where he's far away from home somehow thank you and i i uh i mean your film really powerfully car carves out that a private space for in, in such a dense city and as you said it's a space of queerness you also touched on the queer imaginary that uh a lot of us like as arabs have grew up with that are not western at all i mean I remember if I was here Ramadan, I remember uh, as a as a queer person how excited I was to see that. And this is really something unrelated per se to sexuality. Um, I, I want to uh, unpack all that in my next question. But before I, um, I, I want to move uh, on to Karina, um, maybe to think also about this um, context uh, of the the family, uh, the Arab family who immigrated to the US being um, a first generation immigrant or, you know, the, the child of a first generation immigrant living both with the memories uh, of the place that one has left. I mean, for you, it's a post memory uh, and the, you know, the realities of the US uh, and, and you bring the, these two worlds together beautifully in your film. If you can talk about that context of being Arab and queer and immigrant in the US. Sure, yeah. So my dad immigrated here um, from Syria. He was born in Damascus. Um, I grew up in the US. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with my sister. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, looking back at the home videos, I think there is like a distinct experience, you know, coming of age, like as a first gen, um, you know, child of immigrants. I think that. That's also why I wanted to add the home videos in because I think there's almost some sort of, I don't know, I feel like, I don't know if this is true for other third culture kids, but you almost feel like you owe your parents something growing up because you see how much they sacrificed, how out of their element they are, you know, raising kids in a totally different culture um, than they were used to. And that sort of lack of community they also have. Like, you know, if my dad, you know, married and stayed in Syria, like he would have his family around him. He would have other Syrians, other Muslims, like it would, feel more like home to him. And it's like, you almost feel like you have to feel like home in that way to your parents. You have to, you know, be the person that they expect you to be the person that they're comfortable with. Um, and I think, you know, those are sort of feelings that I was dealing with um, as I started to explore my sexuality, the feeling that, you know, you're letting people down, you're letting people down who don't have anybody else maybe, you know, to relate to um, here so far away from their real home where, you know, they're from specifically speaking about my dad, um, who, like I said, is from Syria. But um, yeah, I think, you know, during the film, as I, you know, me, the character is watching the home videos and sort of reflecting um, upon that love, you know, that a parent has for you, that unconditional love that they show you when you're young, I think is something really special. And I think is something that I also started to question the idea of unconditional love um, and sort of you know, as adults, I think we've all done things that our parents like disapprove of, or, you know, we've disappointed them in some way or another. And it's like, where do you draw the line in terms of unconditional love? Like, is your love really unconditional? Like, how does that evolve into adulthood? Um, so I think that's also something I wanted to explore. Um, but yeah, I think also just growing up with my sister, who obviously shared the same experience of me, um, you know, being first gen, uh, being raised here in the US. I think that was something really special, me and my sister. We had a very special relationship because, you know, like she knows that I'm queer and she's always sort of been that support system for me. Um, and I think that my sister really does symbolize, you know, the joy, even though there is pain, because for me, I also sort of had to sit with my pain in order to process it. Um, but there is joy by the end because I think we do find people, whether it's our family or friends, other people in our communities that do accept us and that do love us and that are that support system for us. Um, and my sister, like I said, she really symbolized that for me. Um, so yeah, it was very special, like dancing Deb K with her by the end of the film and um, having us dance together. I tried to sort of show me and her dancing, like two women dancing, like as they would at a wedding. Um, so, so yeah, I brought all those ideas together. Um, and there's a, a lot of, thank you, uh, Kirina, there's a lot of affect in your film. I want to unpack this further in my next question, which is really about, um, I, I feel that all your films, in a way, decolonize the notion of coming out. And I've been thinking a lot about uh, about that question. 
um, uh, so nowadays, for example, you highlight the difficulties of being Arab and queer in Sweden, this sort of double life that one is sometimes forced to live. Uh, and I love this moment of magical realism when they're uh, leaving the club and then they just magically turn into bros, you know, getting rid of the glitter and the extravagance. Uh, Sarah, in your film, it seems that queer identity is never uh, personal. I mean, the, the outside, as we said, is always seeping into the private space of the two women. Uh, and I, I want to talk later also about the cinematic choices in each of your films, but um, maybe just focus it now on the like this idea of of queerness of coming out. So these very large windows that are overlooking the uh, the port, uh, so the port where the explosion happened. So the the idea of catastrophe, vulnerability, um, always being felt uh, in the film. Um, Karina, I love how at the end of your film, there are no words that are really needed. Uh, I mean, that your character, who is you, basically does not have to say that they are queer or having those queer feelings. I mean, it, it really is uh, an, like we feel that embodied affect in, in the way that the sisters talk to each other, touch each other, uh, dance with each other. And that's, I, I thought, very powerful. Dania, I mean, you talked a little bit about that, but uh, queerness to be this rich inner world that's intimate, that's invisible to to others, and uh, in the, the lack of private space to express that in a city that's very dense like Beirut, um, and literally having to ascend, as you said, to the top of the city. I mean, cinema allows those fantasies to uh, to be expressed on, on screen. Um, uh, so, uh, if you could uh, also talk about um, uh, a little bit more about how you understand queerness, um, not as an expression of, of uh, sexuality only, but as you know, uh, just a rich uh, expression inside. I, I know Karina might have to leave us soon, so maybe we can start with you, uh, Karina. Uh, around this idea of coming out in this Western context uh, as an Arab queer person. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I really love what you said about my film, just how I dealt with that theme, you know? Um, there was a lot that's unsaid, which I sort of like to do in my work, um, because I think, like with my sister, for example, like I never really had to come out, you know? I think it always, it always depends like what context maybe you, you grow up in or sort of like who's around you and who's in your circle. But for my sister and for a lot of my friends, like coming out like wasn't, I think as big of a deal as, I don't know, I think the West likes the idea of like coming out. But for me, it's like, if you have people that, you know, that love you and support you and that like understand you in a very intimate way, like my sister did, no words were really needed when I, you know, started to have a, um, a woman as a partner and you know there weren't any questions or any of this or any it's just sort of part of our world and part of something that she just immediately accepted um but yeah i mean i think the idea of coming out is also something that i continue to think about and i continue to think about you know whether it's necessary i think for some people it is empowering um i think i'm still like working through like my feelings about that um to be honest with you um but yeah i think right now in my life at least like i'm very much supported by you know, my sister, my friends, my partner. Um, and sometimes you just, you know, you need just a small circle just in order to feel supported. And also just me, myself, like putting myself in my art, sort of going through this process, um, making art about queerness in a way is also me sort of trying to control that narrative and control, you know, sort of the way that I present myself and how I hone in those feelings of anxiety um, and how I deal with them. So, so yeah. I don't know if that answered your question, but I think I can say that I'm still thinking about that idea of coming out. Um, I mean, and, and you said it's, it's a process and it, uh, it's also what uh, I think you said is very important is that this is uh, these are narratives that we need to take control of uh, mm -hmm. uh, and not just, uh, you know, follow in the queer coming out narratives um, of, of, you know, other cultures um, just as 
an adaptation of or repetition of of, uh, uh, of queerness in the West. Uh, I know, Kenya, you might have to leave us soon, so just feel free to leave whenever you want. Uh, yeah. I might pop up in like 10 minutes. But, okay, great. Yeah. Um, um, I've actually, a, a friend of mine um, told me something recently that I thought was really beautiful, is that the new way of saying it uh, has been or should be not coming out as much as it is inviting people in. So it doesn't have to be like this person who is coming out of a closet or whatever, but more like if you want to tell someone, you're inviting them into your world. And that is a privilege that that person is getting. It's not a, a challenge that you are overcoming. It's more like you are now going to see the fullness of me and myself and you get to come in. So I, I thought that was uh, pretty beautiful. Um, for, for my film, when we first came up with the idea, uh, Hansa and I, it was about like, oh my God, imagine he is, um, he is unleashes his inner drag queen every day when he's up on in that cabin. And so at first the script was that this is his daily ritual, that he would go up and that he would have everything set up for him, the makeup, the photo, the image, and every the sound and everything. And over the time it took to actually raise money for the film since it's so damn ambitious, um, it the script kept evolving. It wasn't, it felt like it wasn't quite right, like it was falling flat. And every iteration of the script where I would try to put in more dialogue or a coming out or like a, a coworker who would find him or like a, a love story with another person, like I think there might have been maybe 16 drafts of the script with trying to push it in all of these different directions. And none of it felt right at all because it wasn't, it didn't feel real. It didn't feel authentic to the character. It didn't feel like it would, it, it felt like it was trying to go for the ta-da and everything is, you know, whatever. Uh, whether it's drama, like falling into what the, um, the Western world would love to see in terms of drama or falling into the Western world would love to see in terms of like victory. And not, neither of these felt right for, for these characters in Lebanon. And it was only when I went to a, a screenwriting lab in Berlin, Berlinale Talents, short film station, very small, quaint lab, but it was just this, this one tick of a moment where someone, the mentor was like, what about if it's not a ritual? What about if this is the first day, first opportunity? And that was all I needed for it to be like drama and feel like a narrative that you're watching something. It's not just like a, a day in the life of, but without having to bring in drama externally from, you know, these other things. Just he has the opportunity to go up. It is very dangerous and scary. What uh, and scary? What lengths is he willing to go to and why? And kind of keeping that. Why? Why does he? Why is he putting himself in danger? How important is this simple moment of putting a song and and dancing to it and singing along to it, something that we usually get to do like in the shower or whatever in your own space. And and so that, and then being sure to not necessarily end with up there and that, but like, and like, yeah, he is, you know, going back in the same bus to his home to have another day at work and like, you know, not a big change necessarily, but something in his heart, um, he was able to just breathe and something in his heart just kind of like, Kind of let out and you know he gave himself that chance to survive and move forward with the rest of his days having done that and it's kind of his secret and his choice between him and himself I, I love how you left so much space for imagination about the character you're not trying to uh you know put that character in the box of what we expect and what his queerness is about i mean we just shared that moment of just breathing uh, I love how you brought the prayer moment as a spiritual dimension and, and not needing to explain that, you know, like queerness and Islam have to be uh, opposite to each other. Uh, and I think this will just generate so many, so many conversations, uh, which is great. Um, also, I think the way you framed uh, the character uh, if we have time, I, I want to talk a little bit more about the cinematic choices. I'm not, I'm not sure we will, but uh, in all your films, I mean, the, the cinema is, is really very beautiful and strong. Um, uh, so maybe, Sarah, you could talk about, uh, you know, that mi mixture of, of the, like, the queer conversations between the two set in that 
space where you know these huge windows uh, on the outside. You worked with the sound. It also worked beautifully with shadows, with lights, with backlights, uh, with mirrors. So, the, like you, even without the dialogue, the film uh, says a lot in the way it's it's shot. Yeah. Uh, so my biggest uh, um, kind of plan with the aesthetics was to work on something like something that's really ugly, but something that's also really beautiful. Um, the ugly is the obvious what's outside the windows and the windows are huge. There's no way to escape it. Uh, and this was really, really important. You're, you're, whichever way you turn, it's just right there. Uh, and the beautiful was really important to shoot at sunset, which was actually quite a challenge because we had only four days to film and we had literally 45 minutes a day uh, in order to catch the sunset. So it was really insane. Um, so the sunset in essence is really, really beautiful. But at the same time, it was important for the sunset because that's around the time that the explosion happened as well. So it was really important to combine all of these things. The, 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 you know, the, the polarity of something really beautiful and something very ugly was really important because this also seeps into their own relationship. You know, the beauty that they had that you can get little, little senses of through their conversation, but also the ugliness of the separation caused by the trauma. Uh, and their passive aggressiveness and the people that they've become, this kind of bitter, cold people that they've become over this year based on this trauma. So, and the blame that they have towards each other. So all of this was kind of working together with the sound as well, the, especially like the gathering outside. It was really kind of uh, studied like when we hear them really loud and when we don't. So whenever the, the characters are having like this really intimate moment when they're finally connecting, you hear like the gathering kind of dissipates and they're really found in their own bubbles, like finally. And then there's always interruptions because Beirut always interrupts you. You can never get through anything. And this can be external uh, with noise from outside, but it can also be that they interrupt each other or they interrupt themselves personally. Like they, they try to block themselves from feeling something or, or explaining or, you know, something like this. So uh, uh, all of this in sound was also played with any time that something is gonna interrupt them, something comes in from outside. It can be very subtle, like sometimes there's like a ambulance passing by, uh, but also we went through so much uh, audio takes of like this gathering. We were like mostly the crew just sitting there and like, uh, you know, chatting and laughing. I had this little bowl of like uh, topics to discuss, like uh, gossip, uh -huh. you know? So like we would pull a random piece of paper and then we'd all gossip, you know? So like, you know, stuff or like the, the politics, the current politics or anything like that. So we went through all these takes and like there's this moment, for example, where you hear like a laugh and the laugh happens exactly when uh, Basma kind of expresses something really personal and intimate and you hear someone laughing from outside. So it's all, always this kind of interruption or like this little um, sensitivity to, to expressing versus, you know, the, the oppression happening from outside, whether it's the community that the, that the group outside represents or the city itself. And uh, actually, Hassan Musavi talks a lot about that uh, in his new book about uh, queerness in Lebanon. The wada, the situation, is, is always something we have to deal with all the time. Notice uh, uh, you also, I, I mean, I told you this in the beginning, but this beautiful way of, of, of putting together both that a queer joy, queer world, also in your cinematic choices, how you edited the party scene, uh, I mean, the fast edits, the montage, but then uh, when it came to that moment of aggression at the end, uh, you chose to really frame it from with a long shot, long sequence shot from far. Um, and, and so that really brings together those, uh, those impossible uh, things that a, a Arab queer person living in Sweden uh, or anywhere else maybe in the West has to deal with um those contradictions um and uh, if you could talk a little bit about about that 
Uh, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, yeah, as you said, uh, we worked a lot of um, a lot with uh, creating these two contrasts. Uh, this magical world that uh, the audience gets drawn into and you get like sucked into all the fun and the colors and the music and uh, everything is just so joyful uh, in order for me to, you know, when I do the shift and uh, make reality come in, it's going to feel a lot different. And um, it's a, also a symbolic way to just show uh, the different sides of it, that it's very like... Uh, the the polar opposites basically. Uh, so we did spend a lot of time in um, building all these uh, scenes. For instance, the first scene in the store, we built it uh, from scratch. Uh, we uh, like uh, painted the walls with graffiti, and we uh, sewed all the curtains, and we taped little things on the floor so it would look like marble. Like it was. A whole kind of um, uh, yeah, a whole thing. But uh, and then the music for the party scene was also created from scratch uh, uh, because I really wanted a queer song. I had to do it myself, so I went into the recording booth and recorded the song as well. And uh, it, it wasn't planned at all, but it just happened naturally that I would be like, let's just push it to the limit, you know. Uh, and then also we designed a lot of the clothes for this for the party scene and for the other scenes as well and the cape and uh, yeah so we had to do a lot of things um, just from scratch to just get all these colors and all this uh, playfulness into the movie uh, yeah thank you and yeah I mean this is uh, also the queer imaginary that Daniel was talking about the Fawzi Ramadan that uh, a lot of Arab kids grow up with. So it really brought that a uh, queer uh, traditional or folkloric or uh, world that uh, is, is so present in our lives. Uh, I know we have uh, five minutes left. I can go on talking with you all for a long time. So, but maybe in just one minute, each one of you can talk about, you know, anything else you would like to add or, or maybe tell us about your future projects. Uh, starting with Karina, I know you're the one you know, up to this. So. Sure, yeah. Um, so right now I am working on uh, like my feature debut and I want it to be sort of about similar themes that my other work has been about, including queerness and sexuality. Um, it's a coming of age story about an Arab American Muslim girl growing up in Pittsburgh um, in a multicultural household. Like her father is Arab and her mother is um, American. Um, and it's just sort of about how her identity evolve over time. Um, and yeah, it follows her through childhood, young adulthood. So yeah, so I'm really excited to bring in uh, themes that I've you know brought up in my shorts into a feature um, and make something that feels really personal um, and is again, based on my own experiences. Um, and yeah, I'm very excited about it. Great, good luck. Thank you. And I do have to pop off now, so. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Karina. Yeah. It was very nice to meet you. Uh, Daniel, would, would you like to go next? Since you're um, sure. So for um, one last thing to say about Warsha is that um, since we premiered early this year um, and we had to kind of, a lot of the Arab festivals happen in the end of the year, it actually has not played in the Arab world yet. Uh, and I, it will in the end of this year. And I'm very curious to see uh, because it's been very much celebrated around the world with Arabs around the world and LGBT festivals and a lot of different countries and cultures. And but now really is when um, I'm very curious to see and to hear what it feels for an Arab audience and what it feels for the different parts and uh, of the societies and Arab audiences. So that's going to be uh, interesting because um, that's where it needs to where the conversations need to happen. And that's where I think audiences will truly see themselves like even if um the themes in my film are universal for sure it was you know mm -hmm. made by us for us kind of thing um in terms of my next project i'm working on a feature film 
that I thought was unrelated at all, but only now as I pitched it to, I started pitching it to people, I realized that the themes are always there, the same themes, but it's um, it's about a young uh, female university student in Lebanon before all of the crisis and the situations. It kind of goes back on my memories of, of being 20 in Beirut, feeling invincible and wanting to fight the world and fight patriarchy and just kind of change the world. Um, and she's in my film, the girl character stumbles upon the underground world and community of pigeon wars, which in Arabic is Kashashin Hamem. Mm. And it's a very male dominated uh, sport and hobby. And she becomes infatuated with wanting to um, conquer the skies. And so definitely a recurring theme is on one hand, gender and gender norms. Uh, I, I think I really don't like categories and, and like limitations, which is very big in their world. And on the other hand, it all takes place on the rooftops above Beirut. So it also feels, I guess, for me growing up in Beirut, that it can be really claustrophobic as a city. Everyone's eyes is on each other. The, the walls are like screaming at you all the time. And it feels like there's a need to go above or away or to just be able to hear yourself think and, and you know, be yourself. I, great. I, I really look forward to seeing that. Uh, me too. <laughs> so, would you like to just wrap, wrap it up, please? Yeah, um, I'm in this really beautiful uh, phase of uh, when you're just kind of filming and writing and you don't really know where you're going with it. It's my favorite part of everything. You're just kind of going with it until it starts to make sense. Uh, I've been working on it for almost, I don't know, uh, six, seven months now, and it's just a really beautiful feeling. It, for me, it's somewhere in between uh, documentary and fiction. Uh, and for me, it makes complete sense because that's what Beirut means to me. You know, it's like uh, our realities are fiction. <laughs> like they can't be true, you know what I mean? Like, cause it's just unreal. And also whatever you would talk about that's that feels like fiction, is actually our reality. So it makes complete sense for me that it's some kind of blur between the two of them. Uh, but it is exploring a lot of themes about uh, kind of similar to the window, you know, leaving, staying, uh, the split, uh, the, this, you know, challenge within the queer community and how, how do we stay and fight if we all need to leave and, you know, stuff like this. So I, I'm kind of filming and writing and going with it until it starts to come together which is a really exciting part of the process and as someone who has been away for five years i mean i go back all the time but I, it never leaves you that never. <laughs> you never, you're right yeah passion. never does yeah. Uh, but also i think yeah the, the real the the, the imaginary uh, fiction uh, realness i mean it's we're constantly having to deal with both at the same time and I think that's a great segue to, uh, you know, wrap it up with Nauris, who is, uh, I've seen several of your other films, but there's always that, you know, that uh, escape into the magical world and the, and the real, but but you always make the, the queer joy uh, over, like overcome the, the bitter reality. So can you tell us maybe just about your, your future projects, uh, your company. Uh, yeah, I'm working on my debut feature film called The Love Pill, uh, which is a crazy romantic comedy uh, between two Arab guys who are madly in love but try to deny it. And um, the movie starts with one of them getting married to a woman. Uh, and on the way to the wedding, the limousine uh, crashes. And uh, from there on, it's going to be one disaster after the other. So it's um, everything that goes wrong at a wedding goes wrong and they get high at the wedding. And it's just chaos leading to more chaos. And um, uh, yeah, there's a, a huge flashback in the film as well, where we get to see the two men who are in love and their, their story. So that's a, the, a big part of the film. And there's also... Uh, yeah, this the fantasy world and the joy and all of this these elements that you're talking about are in the movie. And then uh, at the end at the, of the movie, we're thrown back into the wedding again to see how it all unfolds. So 
I, I love how you're, I, I look forward to seeing it. And I love how you really, in your films, you take charge of production and you mentioned your, your own company, The Uneven. Uh, and I think it's very important for us to also control our narratives. Thank you all. It's been such a big pleasure. Um, I could go on and on. Uh, thank you, Yasmina, for curating these films together, for allowing for this uh, conversation to happen, and Serge for uh, you know giving space uh, at the festival for queer voices. I would like to mention that I actually also showed my feature film, a queer feature film in San Francisco at the Elephant Festival in 2017. It's, it's, it's really uh, such a big joy and honor to be back in conversation with uh, these wonderful filmmakers. So thank you. Thank, wow. you so thank you so much. This is really great. Thank you so much, really. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.